Okay, well, thanks everybody for coming. I know it's been a super busy morning in the city, so I appreciate you coming out here. Uh, I'm here today at the scene of last week's shooting to appeal to the community and specifically to those who have information that could help prevent this type of reckless violence in our neighborhoods. Last week's shooting uh, in the neighborhood here was shocking, and I know that Calgarians' sense of safety has been shaken. And part of the reason for coming out to this location was to be able to give you some sense as to actually how nice the neighborhood is, how residential it is here, how calm it is, how close we are to the school. And so this isn't the type of place that you would expect that we would be seeing shootings uh, in an urban environment. And so I think, you know, it's one thing to talk about, you know, the 200 block of this street or that street or whatever, but I think it's much more personal when you get into the location and you appreciate when you drive into it, what the location is where this has happened. While we're grateful that the innocent bystander who was shot will recover, this incident had the potential to end much differently. It had the potential to end much more tragically. And this is a tangible example of how organized crime puts all of us at risk. And so we've said many times that the majority of the shootings that occur in Calgary are targeted. But this illustrates the risk that actually accrues or that is there for all of us. So while individuals, uh, while it is individuals involved in organized crime and high-risk lifestyles that are targeted in situations like this, it's anybody that's in close proximity that actually can be impacted and could be caught in the crossfire. Whether the intended target is a friend or a family member of somebody or a neighbor or just simply somebody who was passing by, these types of brazen displays of violence put all of us in harm's way. And I know in a number of shootings in the past, we've talked about the fact that, you know, innocent bystanders could have been hurt because this was so brazen. And I think this is an example of where it actually tangibly did happen in a neighborhood that's calm and quiet. And again, one where you would never expect that something like this would be happening. As, as your police service, we're doing a significant amount of work to address organized crime related violence through a coordinated offender management approach. And so really what we're talking about is focusing resources and efforts on the individuals, the, the people, the places and the locations, the people, the locations and the types of situations that tend to actually drive the most violence. And so through this approach, this year alone, we're monitoring nearly 350 Calgary-based offenders with ties to organized crime and our city, and we've arrested and charged 83 of them, some of them multiple times, for offenses. Thus far this year, we've seized 340 firearms uh, taken off the streets, and we've also conducted a uh, large number of walkthroughs through licensed premises and places like that where folks that are engaged in high-risk lifestyles tend to congregate uh, when we're aware of it and also when we have individuals who are charged and released and they're released into the community on conditions and they're involved or by our assessment they're people who are highly likely to be involved in shootings either as somebody who does shooting or as somebody who could be a victim of a shooting, we will be checking on those people to make sure that they're actually abiding by the conditions that they were released upon. So while we've seen some positive impacts as a result of this work, and our shooting numbers have dropped based on last year's numbers, our efforts are very, very reliant on the cooperation and the close cooperation from our community, namely those that are closest to the people who are practicing high-risk lifestyles and those who choose to put our community at risk. As Calgarians, we can all prevent organized crime-related violence, as people who live in neighborhoods like this, folks know what's normal in their neighborhood and then more importantly, they know what's not. And so sometimes when you see things, it's in neighborhoods like this, you can see that there will be things that will stand out to people that know and understand the neighborhoods. And so sometimes as insignificant as some of those things may seem, they're not insignificant at all. If you see something suspicious, please report that to the police. And if you have surveillance video, we have in our daily lives these days we have more video in our vehicles and in our homes and on our cell phones that we carry than we've had at any point before so there's many many opportunities to intervene in situations like this further if you have information about individuals who are involved in organized crime in calgary please contact police or crime stoppers maybe somebody told you something maybe you witnessed something or maybe you know somebody who's gotten caught up in this lifestyle for whom things have gotten out of control you can talk to the police, you can talk to the crime or talk to crime stoppers, and, and this is the type of thing that could actually save a life. We're all members of this community, one that we understand has to be safe and secure. If we don't have that in our city, we really have little else. Uh, and as I say, when you walk into a neighborhood like this, you can see why this would have such a significant impact here and why we need to make sure that we're all working together and it's all hands on deck to make sure that we keep Calgary safe. Together, we must agree 
on one thing, and that is that gun violence has no place in our city. I just came from the launch of the, uh, the Red Ribbon campaign for impaired driving. And so when you think about that for a second, if you had a loved one who was leaving a party or a function or whatever, and they were, they were going to get in their vehicle and they were going to drive drunk, most of us, I would think, would not let that happen, right? And so I th as I was talking uh, at that function, I was thinking of the same sort of thing in situations like this. If we all agree that, that gun violence in the city is not on and not something we're prepared to tolerate, then we need to all get behind that and make sure that we're working together to take people off of our streets who choose to put our communities, quiet communities like this one, at risk and put Calgarians at risk. I think I can leave it there and just answer any questions you might have in relation to this matter. I think the first question was just where, where are we uh, on this particular matter? Has there been any, any leads or updates uh, since uh, the shooting on Friday? Yeah, fortunately I have uh, Superintendent Daly with me from that particular area. He could probably speak to the, the status of this. Yeah, hi, thanks for the question. Um, and to be fully transparent, it's, it's still pretty fluid. Uh, given the Fridays, uh, it just occurred on Friday. So what I can tell you is the teams the Chief has discussed in our approach here in Calgary, we are well placed in the investigation um, and communicating obviously with the, uh, the impacted victim that uh, had no relation to the intended target in this case. Um, and we're well placed with the conflicts that are going on in Calgary at this time. So, uh, but can't disclose too much in regards to the pace of the investigation uh, at this time. Yeah, I think there's a there's a very concerted effort on behalf of the police service here to be intervening. And I, as I say, we're seeing some good results, but that matters little to people where this is happening in your neighborhood. Like one of these is one too many. I think you raised a couple issues there. You raised, you know, the idea of handguns uh, or gun guns generally. So the guns that we take off the street out of the hands of the, of the people that are doing this are illegal. Those are illegal guns like we the laws are there to deal with that. Uh, the second part of your question was really about things like bail and that type of thing. We've been advocating strongly for bail reform. You know, we feel that things have slipped to a point where there's uh, things have become very liberal in terms of people getting out again and again and again. Um, as I mentioned, that's been the case with a number of people that have been out here. So again, the advocacy toward the federal government around amendments to the criminal code um, is resulting in discussions and we're told something is coming. And so um, we're hopeful in relation to that. But the reality of it is there are there are people on our streets that ought not, they're repeat violent offenders that ought not be on the street. And we all need to be concerned about that. Well, it's a good question. It's a phenomenon that we're seeing across major centres right across North America. Um, I think, you know, again, this particular shooting, we believe, is organised crime related. We believe it was, uh, you know, significantly targeted. Um, and so we believe that the individuals that were involved would have cased out the location ahead of time. So when I talk about um, the fact that there's opportunities for the community to be involved and to alert the police to things they're seeing, those opportunities were the case here. Um, we believe that a vehicle was dumped elsewhere that was, uh, that was uh, involved. And so that would be a second location where there would be an opportunity for people to see and make those connections. And so again, these are places where we're saying with all of the, the video and all of the, uh, the opportunity that there is for folks to be able to make those connections in their, in their daily lives, we just need to make sure that, again, we're all hands on deck. So it, the police can work very hard to try to prevent shootings by, again, focusing on those areas that are, um, you know, the, hot, the hottest or the, or the most uh, dangerous. So the most dangerous people, locations where things are happening, or the types of activities that bring about this type of violence. And so I mean things like drug trafficking, right, that type of thing. Those are high-risk activities that tend to bring violence. People that are involved in that lifestyle tend to carry weapons. And so this is where we focus, right? Um, but we can do that. We can take illegal firearms off the street um, and we can keep working on to hold people accountable after bad things happen. But I think as a community, we all have to get together and decide it's not something we're going to tolerate. And together, we're going to make sure that that, that blight and the idiots that do things like this are going to be going off our streets. Where are the firearms coming from and, and how are the police uh, addressing that side of the equation? 
Yeah, there's a couple of issues there. We do um, very rigorous um, background checks and investigations into the firearms that we seize off the street. One of the reasons we do that is to try to connect them to other uh, firearms crimes. So you can imagine, like we've had 83 shootings in the city to date this year. And so, you know, I believe that there is a small number of people who are have the willingness, in, in a city of 1.4 million, the number of people who would actually pull the trigger in an ur urban environment is quite small. So you can appreciate that any pieces of evidence like the firearm that we can investigate to link shootings uh, together is very important because that's a good way to clear some of those and get the right people off the streets to keep those numbers down. The guns actually come from a number of different uh, places. Some of them are stolen from break and enters. Some of them we find are, uh, are smuggled from outside of the country. In some cases, it's hard to tell. We, we hit situations where either serial numbers are ground off uh, and the firearms have no history or else uh, the, the newest phenomenon, as you know, is uh, in relation to ghost guns and 3D printed guns that are not traceable. No, so no indication of a gang war or anything like that, but certainly a conflict. Um, and the problem with these type of situations when they're organized crime related is that the, oftentimes the, um, the, the, the answer or the retaliation for one particular shooting is planned in the emergency ward uh, at the hospital. And so this is why we come out to say, hey, these are opportunities for all of us just to say, you know, we need to, we need to step in and lean into this as a community and make sure that we're working together to assist police with, with even the smallest thing. Um, that's, we have to make Calgary as, as hospitable for good people and visitors as we possibly can and as inhospitable for violent offenders as we can and we need to do that together. You mentioned just before uh, with the connection obviously with organized crime and the drug trade as well. I mean, you know, the police just released, I think it was just yesterday, one of the largest drug busts that uh, took place in the morning. Are we seeing like our, our, our drugs kind of moving through the city uh, more than maybe in the last uh, well, look, we're a city of 1. Uh, you know, 4 million people, so we're a big market, right? And I think during COVID, when the borders were shut down and that type of thing, it was harder to get uh, drugs to move uh, across the border and this type of thing. So I think those seizures that we're seeing are the product of a lot of good work. But that's, that, that is the uh, sort of the underworld or the folks that are involved in this type of uh, behavior in the shootings. It isn't, people tend not to carry guns just for fun and be involved in that. Usually there's a connection to, you know, some sort of other high risk lifestyle, whether it be drugs and gangs and this type of thing. And then this is the outworking of that. So, so you know, we're working hard. The members are working very hard to be able to penetrate those markets as well. The individuals that were arrested and charged um, for those crimes there, they could easily be people that are involved in in shooting so oftentimes what we'll end up seeing is we get relief from some of those investigations that aren't necessarily related to the shootings themselves but they're related to some of the criminal markets that the that the violence is connected to Yeah, this is very much shaking the community. We know that for sure. Um, I think you're probably aware that after uh, on Monday, we had our victim of services uh, folks out uh, in the neighborhood and at the school to try to sort of help calm um, folks. This is, you know, when you come here, you can sense very, very quickly, this is a safe neighborhood. Uh, this is a neighborhood that's very stable where people have lived for a lot of years, many good people. And so the, na the neighborhood hasn't changed in that sense. But I just think that the message for folks is that Calgary still remains a safe city, but these things are happening and they're happening in places that we wouldn't expect, but these things happening in quiet neighborhoods like this afford new opportunities for, you know, much different than would be at a shopping mall or something like this, uh, new opportunities for um, community to cooperate with police and join together to prevent gang and gun violence. If there are people out there, uh, I, I mean, again, it's kind of a helpful question, and they do maybe have something or they don't know what they have and they maybe, could this help? What's the best way that they can approach uh, Calgary Police and, and get that material to you? I think one of the ways is through the uh, non-emergency line. You can plug in that way. But if people are concerned about anonymity, and oftentimes that's what it is, people say, you know, I have information, but I'm really concerned about retribution or that type of thing. So Crime Stoppers is excellent because Crime Stoppers can offer that confidentiality. But I think if there's opportunities to be able to speak with the caller, I've taken Crime Stoppers tips in the past too, where I just wish I could have spoken to the person to ask those couple questions that maybe weren't contained in the, uh, in the tip. 
And so if that's an opportunity or if the tipster is willing to talk to the police, they can indicate that uh, to Crime Stoppers and they can make that connection directly.